Well, good evening, church history friends. My name is Barb Walden, and it is a joy to welcome you to the first night of our summer series. Uh, this July, we will explore a number of Community of Christ historic sites virtually, and we are thrilled that you're joining us for this virtual journey down the Restoration Trail. So now that you're here with us, let me tell you what you can expect this evening. I'll share briefly some Kirtland history to help set the stage for our virtual tour. I'll then hand the screen over to Locke and he will take us through a, a virtual tour of the Kirtland Temple. And there'll be times throughout the tour to ask questions and make comments about what you're seeing and about what Locke is sharing with us. Feel free to use the chat feature to share your name, where you're joining us from this evening, and for your usual witty banter. But when it comes to those important church history questions and Kirtland Temple questions, please use the Q&A feature in sending us your questions tonight. For most of you, that Q&A feature will appear at the bottom of your screen. We don't want to miss those questions, so please send them through that Q&A feature. We hope to wrap up the evening program around 8 p.m. Central tonight, making it a full hour of Kirtland Temple history, and it doesn't get any better than that. Now, our summer series is not only exploring the history behind four Community of Christ historic sites, we're also helping to preserve them. So any donations received during our summer series will go towards the ongoing maintenance and preservation of the Community of Christ historic sites. Uh, Locke will drop the donations link and the mailing address in the chats for anyone wishing to send in a donation. Thank you all for your consideration and for helping preserve the historic sites. So now let's take a look at a little Kirtland history to help set the stage for Locke's virtual tour of the Kirtland Temple. I'm going to do a quick screen share for the visual learners in the crowd. All right, I trust you'll let me know if you're not able to see the screen. Now, the first Latter-day Saint missionary team arrived in Kirtland in 1830 as they were on their way from Western New York to Jackson County, Missouri. And the missionaries went out of their way to see Sidney Rigdon, who was living in Mentor, Ohio, which is a town just north of Kirtland. Now, Sidney was a pretty influential minister in the Church of Christ, uh, the Stone Campbell Movement. And he emphasized restoration of the primitive Christian church during this time, as he was overseeing around 17 congregations in the Kirtland region. Uh, Parley Pratt was one of Sidney Rigdon's followers. You could say that Sidney Rigdon was a mentor of Parley Pratt. Uh, and he was also, Parley was one of the missionaries arriving in Kirtland on his way to Jackson County, Missouri. So these missionaries increased awareness of the new Latter-day Saint Church in Kirtland and many of the people living in the area, including, including Sydney and Phoebe Rigdon, who you see on the screen, were soon converted. And this new wave of converts doubled the membership of the church, and soon the majority of church members were living in Ohio, not Western New York. So keep in mind, during this time, every member of the church is a convert to the church. Some of Sydney's former followers were not only joining the church, they were also taking on significant leadership positions in this brand new church. And here's a list of a few of those joining the church in Kirtland who were associates of Sydney Rigdon. So F.G. Williams, Frederick Granger Williams, would become a member of the First Presidency along with Sydney Rigdon. Uh, Edward Partridge would serve as bishop in Missouri. Newell K. Whitney would later serve as bishop in Kirtland. Lyman White and Orson Hyde would become apostles in this new church. And these folks and others gave a, an instant credibility to the church. And they, they created a church base in Northeast Ohio. And this was a significant reason that the church headquarters shifted from New York to Kirtland in 1831. There was a lot of things happening in Kirtland in the 1830s, and, and I'm going to try to, to give you a little bit of that in this brief overview. So when Sidney Rigdon joins the church, he also brought an emphasis on living out the book of Acts chapter 2 and restoring a community, and that'd be a community based on this concept of living all things in common. More specifically, Sidney becomes an influential spokesman uh, for building shared community in Kirtland. 
He said, our pretensions to follow the apostles and all their New Testament teachings required a community of goods that as they established their order in the model church of Jerusalem, we were bound to imitate their example. Uh, this resonated for early church leaders and members. And so this action plan, if you will, based on Acts chapter two, eventually led to the construction of the Kirtland Temple, the first Latter-day Saint temple. And this was an incredible achievement for a community of mostly impoverished individuals. So as missionaries traveled, they would encourage converts to relocate to Kirtland. And so as people were moving to Kirtland, you found multiple families living under one roof. Uh, multiple families under one roof was pretty common in Kirtland, uh, but they were not living in the, the best of mansions or highfalutin homes by any means. Uh, Truman Coe described the homes of some church members in Kirtland as, quote, a grotesque assemblage of hovels and shanties. Very few of these cabins were accounted fit for human habitations. So the thought that, that this group of people living in poverty are sacrificing to construct this remarkable house of worship that you see here on the screen is extraordinary. I mean, it's remarkable. But poverty was a serious concern in Kirtland. Uh, the Kirtland Bishop, Newell K. Whitney, who you see here was commissioned to watch over the poor to administer to their wants by humbling the rich and proud. That was literally his assignment to go and humble the rich and proud. And one solution to, to feeding the poor was through fast meetings where individual church members would abstain from their meals and they would bring butter and bread and other foods to the bishop's storehouse for distribution to the poor. So Newell K. Whitney would be collecting these items uh, with a plan of spreading them out to uh, the poor members of the community. Uh, they also held feasts for the poor, which were these open meals for those who were in need, people like widows and orphans and homeless in the community. Uh, the evangelists would also give blessings during the feast for the poor to help meet both the physical and the spiritual needs of the community. Both were important during this Kirtland period. And Newell and Elizabeth K. Whitney hosted one of these feasts uh, for the poor in their home, which you can see uh, there, the yellow house up at the top. Their feast for the poor was so large that the guests were served in shifts over a three-day period, which I think says a lot about how, how many poor people that were living in Kirtland, but also the magnitude of the generosity of Newell and Elizabeth Whitney. Now, education was another serious concern during this time. And a two-story schoolhouse and print shop was built directly behind the temple with hopes of meeting the church needs for both a school, a gathering place, and a printing press. And, and this two-story building was built before the Kirtland Temple um, was, was constructed. So that, that tree area that you see here uh, behind the temple is where that two-story building was once located. Unfortunately, it isn't there any longer, but you can see the location of it. And the first floor of that building was used as a gathering place where the congregation would gather before the temple was built. This was where church mem members, <clears throat> church ministers, excuse me, were schooled and where the lectures of faith were given. It's also where the first apostles, the, meaning the Council of Twelve, were ordained in 1835. While up on the second floor of that building, Oliver Cowdery and F.G. Williams had a hopping printing press that was turning out a number of first edition books. Um, the first Doctrine and Covenants in 1835 was printed. The second edition of the Book of Mormon came out of this print shop. And Emma's first church hymnal was printed there in 1835. It came hot off the presses just in time for the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. A number of newspapers like the Messenger and Advocate, Northern Times, and, and others were printed at this print shop as well. In Kirtland, we also see a rapidly evolving priesthood with new offices and leadership roles being established. And here is a great graphic from John Hamer that shows this rapid growth of leadership positions or, or offices in the church. From 1830, as you see, it appears in blue on the screen uh, to, to my left, 
That's what uh, the priesthood looked like in the 1830s. And then in green, you can see what the church leadership and priesthood looked like by 1835. And mind you, that appears in green. We also see an incredible amount of revelations happening during this period. Something like over 60 sections of the Doctrine and Covenants were based in Kirtland, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was more. Um, I've often heard folks say that when visiting Kirtland, it's like walking through the Doctrine and Covenants. There was a lot happening in Kirtland during the time the temple was being constructed and used. Kirtland is often looked at as a glorious time, a Pentecostal season for early church members but it was also a very difficult time. Uh, this rapidly evolving theology and priesthood offices created tensions among the more conservative members within the church. Then you had economic and political struggles creating more tension, not only within the church, but with the larger community. So opening the Kirtland Safety Society Bank began with the best of intentions for alleviating poverty within the community, but a bank without a charter garnered very little confidence from the public. And the failure of the bank brought on lawsuits and the internal dissensions caused by the bank troubles led many of the church members to pack up and head for Missouri in 1838. Over 500 people left in one day with what was called the Kirtland Camp. And by 1839, the following year, there were only around 100 church members remaining in Kirtland left in Kirtland. So in the years that followed, the few church members that remained in Kirtland did what they could to maintain and care for the temple. They rented it out for a short period to the Western Reserve Teachers uh, Seminary and various Latter-day Saint groups and leaders like William McClellan and James Strang, Zadok Brooks and William Smith would return to Kirtland and hold conferences in the lower court of the temple. Uh, Martin Harris served as a tour guide and a caretaker for a number of years before moving to Utah. So by the 1870s, we begin to see a fairly steady congregation worshiping in the Kirtland Temple. And by the 1880s, Kirtland becomes a significant gathering place for members of the reorganization or community of Christ. So massive efforts were going into maintaining and restoring and preserving the Kirtland Temple during the early 80s. And that led for, for decades. Much of this effort in the beginning was headed up by the brothers William and Edmund Kelly, or E.L. Kelly, but I'd like to think that E.L. Kelly's wife Cassie, or Catherine, did most of the work. And you can see her standing, uh, looking at her husband sitting there, is E.L. Kelly. The Kirtland Temple was host for the 1883 and 1887 General Conferences, and it was a very exciting time for the reorganization. Kirtland was a significant gathering place. So in the decades that followed, the Kirtland Temple congregation continued to grow in numbers as they worshiped in the temple regularly throughout the week. They held classes and weddings and priesthood meetings, uh, a number of activities inside the historic house of worship. The temple grounds were used for annual reunions or church camps beginning around 1911 and continuing until the late 1950s. So it's easy to think that the, that Kirtland Temple history ended in 1839 when the majority of church members uh, departed from Missouri. But you'll find there is a lot of fascinating stories and really remarkable people embedded within the temple's history after the 1830s period as well. Some of my favorite Kirtland Temple stories comes from the, the post 1830s period. And we have a number of books we'll recommend for you after Lachlan's virtual tour if you're interested in learning a lot more about Kirtland history. So that's a little Kirtland history to help lead into the big event tonight, which is the virtual tour of the Kirtland Temple. And I am so excited that our virtual tour guide tonight is Lachlan Mackay. Locke was the first paid full-time site director at the Kirtland Temple. He began in 1993, and served as site director in Kirtland until 2002. You can see here the cover of the Herald, um, a, a young Lachlan Mackay when he first began as the site director. Locke left his position in Kirtland when he began a much bigger role as director of Community of Christ Historic Sites in 2002. And it's hard to believe that was 20 years ago. So I'm gonna hand things over to Locke 
as he's going to take it from here to share the virtual tour of the Kirtland Temple. All right. I want to start by talking just a little bit about temple construction. I'll use this beautiful photo by Jim Doty to illustrate. So the temple was built, of course, between 1833 and 1836. They had hoped to build of bricks, but many of the bricks apparently crumble as they fire them. They're in a bit of trouble. But Artemis Millet, a new member, had come down from Upper Canada, the Kingston or Lowborough area in Upper Canada, and he brought with him, it seems, a building technique new to the Kirtland area. The idea was to gather pieces of sandstone of various sizes and shapes, then using mortar to hold that stone together, they build a wall about two feet thick and about 45 feet high. You see the exposed rubble wall in this image. Now this is during restoration work. So the stucco has been removed. You see piles of it down at the bottom of this photo. Uh, so the stucco, original stucco removed. This is before the new stucco goes back on. But here's what it looked like. Um, there'd been a fair number of patches by this time. But so the stucco was described originally as blue which I think was a slate gray. The, they had painted lines on the stucco, trying to make it look like it was built of large dressed or cut stone block, which would be the most magnificent building you could put up at the time if you could afford it. And of course they couldn't. So they're using stucco and paint to replicate the cut stone block look. They had sent young people out to gather old crockery and glass that's crushed even finer and dumped into the stucco so that when the sun hit it, it would sparkle brilliantly. The roof of the temple, wood shingles dipped in a red lead paint to preserve them. So blue gray walls, a reddish brown roof and the doors uh, moderate olive green I like that one. It's a pretty colorful temple early on, unfortunately toned down through the years, but Structurally, the building really survived amazingly intact. They hope to build two more of these buildings just to the south of the temple. Those instructions, part of the Doctrine and Covenants, Community of Christ, section 91, for the Church of Jesus Christ, that's section 94, it talks about how on the first lot to the south of the temple, they hope to build a house for the presidency, so a, in effect, an office building. Then on the second lot to the house, to the south of the temple, a house for their printing operations, a print shop. So try and imagine not one of these buildings, but the plan was three in this whole area from what is now Maple Street, just north of the temple, to what is still Joseph Street, a block to the south, was going to be their public square with their community centered around that public square. I'm going to stop screen share for a minute and then start a new one so that we can begin to tour. We're going to start by going into the outer court. So when you walk through one of two front doors, this is what you're going to see. I sometimes get asked, why two doors and not one? Well, my question is, why not three? That was more common. Often there was a men's, a women's, and a minister's. But because Latter-day Saints have a lay ministry, I think that's why no separate minister door, uh, they did, I think, kind of have a men's and a women's, at least on some occasions, they're segregating with men on one half of the congregation and women on the other. The doors, um, this is a preaching church layout, so the exterior doors go into interior aisles. There are two aisles, uh, which allows more seating closer to the pulpit. So it's, it's for listening to preaching versus a processional church layout where you have one central aisle, the kind of church people sometimes want to be married in, one central aisle to proceed down. That's not what happens in Kirtland. Uh, the spoken word was most important in this tradition. As we go through the temple, you're going to see some beautiful decorative woodwork. Depending on the age of the craftsman, though, they had very different styles. Early on, a man by the name of Jacob Bump was in charge. He had apprenticed using the 1806 edition of Asher Benjamin's architectural pattern books. It's like this old house on PBS, but in the book form. It was very labor intensive in style. 
featured a lot of this kind of work. This is called fluting, grooves cut into a plank to form a pattern. We're gonna see more of that labor intensive style in the lower court or first floor of the temple. Uh, Bump got mad and left the community for a time. Truman Angel comes in to help finish up. He's younger, learning later. He apprenticed using the 1830 edition of the pattern book. It's simpler and quicker, features more of this kind of work. This is a Greek fret. You see running across the top of the door, pieces of wood cut out, applied to form that geometric pattern. We're gonna see more of that again on the second floor of the temple. I wanna pause um, if anybody wants to drop questions into the Q&A, um, either about construction or about the outer court. At the moment, we have a question from Myra Elliott. And she asks, what are the two buildings on the right and left of the Kirtland Temple drawing? And I think this question is related to, um, back in my presentation, I had showed an engraving from Henry Howe from 1846. And to answer your question, Myra, one of those buildings was uh, the Methodist Meeting House, while we think the other one uh, could have been the Kirtland Bank. It could have been Oliver Cowdery's law office. Uh, maybe Lachlan can tell us for sure. After Locke's virtual tour, uh, I'll go back to that engraving so everyone else can see what it is Myra's uh, referring to in her question. Great question, Myra. We also have a question from Blake Rosberry, and he asked the very important question. I never asked when I lived nearby, why no restrooms? Why are there no public restrooms in the, the temple lock? Is that a question about why now or why in the 1830s? <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I hope that's an outhouse question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is, Barb, especially. Um, so I do think they would have had a privy somewhere outside, and we would desperately love to find it. Privies, privies of course, are gold mines for archaeologists, uh, but we have not located uh, the 1830s Kirtland privy. But a decision was made very early, in fact, probably 1880s, to try and preserve the temple just as it was. Um, which means the decision was made very early not to modernize it by gutting spaces to put things like modern bathrooms in. And I'd like to think that we were on the cutting edge of the preservation movement, and that's why we made such a great decision. I really think that's not what is happening. I think that we decided we wanted to make it look just as it did um, to prove that the temple looked just as it originally did, um, and that we were the original church because we owned it. So I think it's an identity issue early on. Um, uh, the goal trying to show that because we owned the original temple that looked just as it originally did, that proved that we were the original church, not anybody else. So I'm suspect of our motives, but I'm still thrilled with the decision not to gut spaces to modernize and put in things like elevators or pipe organs or bathrooms. We have a question from Michael Wellington, and he asks, what kind of wood is most of the temple made of? Much of the temple is walnut and poplar and oak. There might also be some beech. I think that the, the kiln, the lumber kiln that church members had caught fire multiple times in one winter, and they lost much of the lumber each time. So they ended up having to buy from local non-members, and I think they're using whatever they can get. Ryan Quick asks, is there any reason that the colors have been toned down in renovations over time? The exterior is very white, not bluish. Yeah, I'm disappointed that the, uh, the color has been toned down. And in fact, I made what I thought was a compelling argument that we needed to go back to blue gray walls and a reddish brown roof. We did get the green front doors back. Uh, my argument was we would never dream today of changing their written documents to say what we think they should have said. Uh, and since they're dead, they've lost their voice. Why do we think it's okay to, to change the artifacts they left behind to reflect what we think is pretty? Um, I thought it was a compelling argument, but I, apparently it wasn't because it's still white. <laughs> um, initially, the sun would have just faded the stucco. So it, it wasn't intentional early on. It just faded to kind of a slate gray. Um, and at some point, the sandstone around the windows and the doors because it has a lot of iron in it, it rusts and starts developing rust streaks that run down the side of the building that are pretty unattractive. 
So I think a decision was made early um, that we ought to do something to make it look better. And instead of going with like a, a blue gray paint, I'm guessing that by the 1950s, there was this idea that um, the house of the Lord should be white signifying purity, um, which I think would make a different decision today. But that, that's, I think, was probably motivating them when they went with that pristine white for the first time in the 1950s. Will Perez asks, how did the community of Christ end up owning the temple? How was ownership passed down when the saints left Kirtland? This is a great question, and I think Locke has got an hour-long class exploring uh, ownership of the Kirtland Temple, but Locke, are you able to give an abbreviated answer to this great question? I will, and then I'll talk to Will tomorrow with an hour-long answer. Um, <laughs> he happens to be in Nauvoo. So uh, the short answer is adverse possession. Um, the ownership of the land that the temple sat on in the 1830s and 40s was very complex. There are people at times selling the building before there's any record that they own it. At times, Joseph owns it personally. At times, he owns it in behalf of the church. But prior to his death, it was back with Joseph in behalf of the church. He's killed. Um, there are multiple maneuvers by the various Latter-day Saint tradition churches to try and strengthen their claim. There are sales of the temple, some not particularly real, more, more straw sales. Um, at times it's selling for $10,000 and then being sold for just a few dollars by that same person a few years later. Um, eventually though, uh, community priced members, Russell Huntley and Joseph Smith III get possession. Um, it's a, a sale in, in that is authorized by the state legislature in Ohio. And in Russell Huntley had revived, uh, I'm sorry, um, Grandis and Newell had revived some litigation and managed to get the Ohio State Legislature to pass legislation specifically so that Joseph Smith's properties could be sold to settle some of the, the suits coming out of the Kirtland Bank failure. Um, so the temple is sold on the courthouse steps. Uh, the guy that buys it gets um, apparently 13 acres free and clear that sells just the temple then for $150 to Russell Huntley. Huntley later affiliates with the reorganization, sells it to Joseph Smith III and Mark Forskett for $150. Um, they hope to sell it to the city of Kirtland for a town hall, but realize that their claim might be problematic. So they've decided instead to, to put together a lawsuit um, now, the real motivation wasn't to get clear ownership. It was, again, about identity. Um, but the Kirtland Temple suit, which was kind of a shock for us because we didn't have local counsel. So the judge took our, uh, our brief, which said the reorganized church is the true and lawful successor to and entitled to the property thereof, Joseph Smith Jr.'s church. I think that's our language. He just read it back, which was great for us. But then he said, oh, but you filed the case wrong, case dismissed. So the, the Kirtland Temple suit, which um, would be familiar to member, members of the community of Christ, doesn't really have any legal standing. Um, but at that point, Joseph III just gave the temple to his church, turned possession back over, and it really passes through adverse possession, which in Ohio means that you own it, you proclaim your ownership, you care for it, you maintain it. 21 years and cloudy ownership becomes clear. And that's really the mechanism that any of any of the Latter-day Saint churches were going to have to use because ownership was so mixed up in the 1830s and 40s. So believe it or not, that's a short answer. Uh, Blake Rosberry asks, I believe Kim Loving did much research on this topic. Do we have his work? Kim did an amazing job on this topic, and his work is available online. It's in a Mormon History Association journal. I would Google. Um, Mormon History Association Journal, Kim Loving, Kirtland Temple, and it'll pop up. Um, and I think that there are maybe at University of Utah, I think you can get MHA journals digitally for free. I think it's Kim Loving that compares the 1880s lawsuit and the outcome of that to if the RLDS showed up to a baseball game and their opponents never showed up, they would have lost the game anyway, or something to that effect, which I thought was a great comparison. Arriving to a baseball game, your opponents aren't there, and you still lose the game. Yeah, it's, it's not one of our prouder moments. All right, let's climb the stairs and have a look at the second floor. 
So 33 steps you have to go up to get to the second level. And here's what you see when you do. This is the upper court. It was gonna be the home of something called the School of Mine Apostles. As the name implies, it was intended to be classroom space for missionary and priesthood training. This is an inner court, they called it, or the upper part of the inner court. And we would have climbed stairs in the outer court to get here. So Old Testament tab tabernacle and temple language. They also started to install in this room, but weren't able to finish what they called veils or partitions. At this point in time, they're simply room dividers. They become something different in Nauvoo, Illinois in the 1840s, but here, simply room dividers. So the plan is to wrap canvas around these large wooden rollers on the ceiling. You would attach ropes to them, thread them through little donut, they look like powdered donut holes on the ceiling, they would go into the ceiling, into the crawl space, down into the columns. I'll see if I can show you one. And they were gonna have windlasses um, here. You see a metal rod sticking out the side. So you'd put a, a, a crank on this rod and start turning. And that would raise and lower these massive canvas curtains. So there are openings between the pew boxes. You're gonna drop curtains here and here. So one big classroom becomes four small ones. And then they're also gonna divide off around and between each level of the pulpits to give the privacy for people to study or pray. The tiers of pulpits are probably the most distinctive feature of the temple. They're for the two priesthoods. On the west, Melchizedek priesthood pulpits, uh, what we're looking at now on the east, Aaronic priesthood pulpits. The letters represent different leadership quorum presidencies. So PDA on the bottom, repeated three times, for the deacons quorum presidency. Above that, a PTA for the teachers quorum presidency. Above that, a PAP for the priests. On top, a BPA for the bishops who preside over the Aaronic priesthood. On the west, on the bottom, we're going to see a PEM for the elders quorum presidency, an MHP for the high priests. That starts to get a little confusing. A PMH for the high council. Uh, this is confusing, but remember at this point in time, the, the quorum of the 12, the apostles had no authority in a stake. They were not supposed to be home. They were supposed to be out on missions. So anywhere the church was organized, the high council had authority and the rest of the world, the apostles were in charge. Uh, but because they're not supposed to be home, no seats for them. And then on top, an MPC for the first presidency of the church, the three people presiding over the entire church. To confuse us, they typically ignored these letters though and would sit not by office, but rather by age, older members on top to younger ones down bottom. By Nauvoo in the 1840s, they templed a bit, the temple they built here. There are lots of cues on the pulpit, certainly for quorum, but a little more confusing by the time the folks who go west build their St. George, Utah temple, the letters are a little different again. But what was most important is that they were a teaching tool. Everybody's a new member here. Every time they walk in, these letters help teach them the administrative structure of their new church. The benches are not attached. They slip back and forth. These desktops are later editions, but they flip up and lock into place. So you can face either end of the room, depending on who's presiding at the time. On the columns, you see large Greek frets, pieces of wood cut out, applied to form that pattern. Simple, quick. Remember downstairs, we're gonna see something very different questions on the upper court or anything else? We do have a question from Lou Shepherdson, and Lou asks, why the pew boxes as opposed to more rows of pews? Was that related to keeping warm in the winter? Yeah, the pew boxes come right out of their New England heritage. So um, in many ways, Kirtland Temple is a New England meeting house, and the pew boxes reflect that. Apparently, um, so that's just what they knew growing up, that it would help keep heat in 
and the drafts off and you could bring foot warmers or soap stones with you, heating devices, and they would sit on the floor and radiate heat. Um, so that uh, it, very much typical New England meeting house. Things that make the temple different from a typical New England meeting house. We talked about one of them already, tiers of pulpits on both ends. That is not typical. Another is the fact that the temple has windows on every wall, even on the third floor with lots of little offices, you're going to see windows on every wall, including all the interiors. So you can get light on the west side of the building uh, from the rising sun in the east. A third distinctive feature, normally the second floor of the House of Worship in New England at this time would be a gallery or balcony. So you could sit either in, in the balcony or if it was a gallery along the sides, but this would be open and you'd be looking down into the first floor. Um, so this is very different to have two large, almost identical rooms stacked one on top of the other, not at all common. This happens though, because I think the temple grows out of two desperate needs these people had. They understood that they had uh, been commanded to have a school for their ministers. So they, they needed a place to, to teach their leaders and their, their priesthood. Uh, that's this floor, the upper court. They also were, didn't have enough money to pay rent on the meeting house they were worshiping in. They needed a place to gather together to worship. That's the room below. So those two distinct needs result in the two large, almost identical rooms stacked one on top of the other. Ronald Baldwin asks, were the canvas room dividers ever actually installed and used? Were the canvas room dividers ever installed and used? I think on the second floor, I think they're not finished. So never installed. No, we, we discussed this sometimes um, passionately among uh, some of the Kirtland Temple folk, but uh, I am not at all convinced in part because there's original rollers in a few of these columns. Uh, let me see if I can get a better shot for you. So for example, you see three of them here and there is nowhere where, where the wood on wood, I believe would, would create considerable wear patterns here. Um, I, I don't see any evidence that these were actually ever used on the second floor. Downstairs, they're in and functioning and used regularly in the 1830s. Uh, I think they worked downstairs, but they decided they could make them work better, redesign the system, start to install it on the second floor, and are never able to finish it here. Yeah. Two more questions, and I, I think you've answered these questions, but I want to give you an opportunity to, to say a little bit more if you want to. Uh, Myra Elliott asks, have the curtain mechanism been restored? And Sherry Rushton asks, what are the cutouts on the tall columns? So have the curtains been restored? So downstairs, yes. <laughs> I think we put asbestos curtains back in in the late 19th century. Uh, they did not survive, and they are long gone. So there are no veils or partitions or curtains in the temple today, but there are mechanisms that they would have been operated by. And the cutouts in the columns are access to those windlasses that would have controlled the veils, controlled the curtains by putting a crank on these metal rods and turning. So the ropes go up and into the crawl spaces and then back down, uh, attached to these wooden rollers here and here. And, cause these to spin, to raise, and lower the veils. Nolan and Deanne White ask, when was the temple electrified? When was the temple electrified? I'm embarrassed to say that it was long enough ago that I moved away that I have forgotten, but it was surprisingly early, early, um, early 20th century. And I think it's because uh, somebody who owned the Cleveland uh, electric train system <laughs> Uh, live nearby at, at Moreland, which is now Lakeland Community College, just across the valley from Kirtland. So I believe that Kirtland had electricity really pretty early, um, probably because of this wealthy gentleman living not far away. In continuing on that topic, Lou Shepherdson asks, did they have any other lighting in these main rooms for nighttime use other than the windows? 
presumably the lights we now see are a much later addition. Yeah, so the primary light source, of course, is the sun, uh, but they do meet at times what they call early or first candlelight. And there's some physical evidence that I'll show you on the ceiling of the room below that suggests they had candle burning chandeliers, uh, four of them down there. The reason I say candle and not whale oil is the N.K. Whitney store day book survives and they are selling lots of candle wicking and very few lamp supplies. So that's why I think they're candle burning. Uh, downstairs, four chandeliers. We don't know what they looked like. We don't know if they were turned wood or tin or, or what they were, but there is physical evidence that they were there. That is all the questions we have for now. All right, we're gonna climb to the third floor. So if we were actually climbing, we'd be going up 33 steps again. So 33 between each level. And when we get here, there are five attic offices or school rooms. And the reason there are five of them is that we are in the attic at this point. And so there are king post trusses built into these walls to support the roof. So imagine a massive timber right here and a brace cutting across and another brace coming down, another brace here. So they simply wrapped the king post trusses with lath and plaster. And those trusses sit on the columns in the rooms below. Um, so th that's the, the width of these rooms matches the distance between each pair of columns in the two rooms below. So once you wrap those king post trusses, you end up with five long, thin offices. They held in these rooms in 1836 and 37, what they called the Kirtland High School. Sidney Rigdon talks about, now he's talking about the far west Missouri temple, which didn't get built, but he's talking about why they're going to build it. And among other things, he said, we are tired of our people being taken advantage of by the more learned. We are going to use the temple to teach them to read and write so they can take care of themselves. And you see that lived out in Kirtland as well through the Kirtland High School. Three departments with students ranging in age from six through 30-year-old Wilfred Woodruff. The departments were the, the um, juvenile department where they would learn the rudiments of education, how to read and write. There was also an English department, which wasn't just English, but geography and grammar and arithmetic. And then the classics, which was Latin and Greek languages. So uh, I think they're not all here at the same time. I think those students are coming and going throughout the day. They also held a Hebrew school here at times. It was probably also in the schoolhouse behind uh, times, but a Hebrew school. They hired Joshua Satius to teach them Hebrew. He was extraordinarily talented. They, they were greatly blessed to have found him. Some of his Hebrew textbooks survive. And in those textbooks, you can find the word Navu carrying with it connotations of beautiful. So Joseph certainly learned that in Kirtland from Joshua Satius. In the evenings, administrative quorums would take over these rooms. High priests on Monday nights, 70s on Tuesday nights, elders on Wednesday nights. And then this room on the West was also the president's office. So Joseph's office it was here January 21st of 1836 that Joseph had a vision of his brother Alvin and the celestial kingdom that is later canonized by our friends in the Church of Jesus Christ. I think that's section 137 in the LDS Doctrine and Covenants. Also here, a committee meets to write the prayer of dedication for the temple. Um, and then that's read in the lower court, read from a printed document, which uh, was uh, upsetting to some folks who thought the spirit shouldn't be constrained by saying a written prayer, uh, but it was on that occasion a written prayer, uh, written here, delivered on the first floor or the lower court. That's also one that was canonized, uh, not in Community Christ, but in the Church of Jesus Christ in 19, I'm sorry, 1876. And that's their section 109 of the LDS Doctrine and Covenants. Questions on the third floor or anything else? Pam Robeson asks, is there any special significance to the 33 steps between the different levels? Uh, we have wonderful stories that we've made up through the years about special significance. Um, you know, some people think it's one year for uh, each year of Christ's life. Some people think it's 
um, related to masonry. I, I don't think there's symbolism there. And we also have come up with wonderful symbolism in the decorative woodwork in the temple. Um, really elaborate uh, symbolism, we would come to find meaning uh, in the woodwork. But what we didn't realize in many cases is, yes, there are ancient symbols in the temple woodwork. Um, what's happening, though, is that that Asher Benjamin, that, that pattern book developer I talked about earlier, he is basically stealing um, engraved plates from English pattern books of the day. And the English are fascinated by ancient cultures, Greek and Roman cultures uh, and others. So yes, there are ancient symbols in the woodwork of the temple, but they're transmitted through these pattern books. And that was an element that we didn't really understand until recent years when Elwin Robison, an architectural historian down at Kent State, uh, was tremendously helpful in helping us understand the context in which the temple was built. That is all the questions we have for this time. And to the lower court we go. So back down on the ground floor, they would gather in this room on Sunday mornings for hymns and prayers and sermons and testimonies. Uh, they would serve sacrament or communion. You see brown tables. These are in front and in back, and they flip up and lock into place. They would take a break. Uh, they would go home. They would come back for more hymns and prayers and sermons and testimonies. Um, they would go home for dinner. Some would then come back for choir practice. You see choir lofts in the four corners. And they would sing from all four corners at the same time. I talked about Jacob Bump and Truman Angel, the different craftsmen. I wonder if we can get a good look at this keystone. I got too close. So on the west side, you see a beautiful beaded keystone. This design comes right out of Asher Benjamin's 1806 edition. A lot of work, very labor intensive. Contrast that with the keystone on the east. I'm not sure if we'll get there or not. Um, nope, let me try again. So this one is flat with little holes drilled in it to form a pattern. Much, much simpler and quicker, likely the work of by or under Truman Angel. So very different styles depending on, on the age of the craftsman. Uh, we talked about Greek frets on the second floor, but down here on the lower court, you're gonna see fluting on these columns, grooves cut in, to form the pattern. Just like upstairs, the benches aren't attached, they slip back and forth, but because this is worship space versus a classroom space, there are no desks in, this, uh, in these pew boxes. I talked about um, lighting devices. So these large plaster rings have metal hooks in the center, and I believe that the chandeliers are suspended from those hooks and the soot from the candles would rise and some of it be trapped by those plaster rings. We've got later photos that show a white ceiling with big black spots. They're doing their job, they're capturing the soot and helping to make it easier to clean. They would gather to this room on Thursdays. Um, they would fill up the room, they would drop the curtains. You see an opening here and Let's see, let me find the other opening. Right here. So again, one big room becomes four smaller ones. They'd use these on Thursdays for prayer meetings. They'd fill up the room, drop the curtains, assign an elder to each corner, 
and have four services going at once. Uh, it would speed things up, allow more to participate, but even with those curtains in place, some of their Thursday prayer meetings would go from 10 in the morning to three or four in the afternoon. They are generally presided over by Joseph Smith Sr. It was from this room that the temple was dedicated March 27th of 1836. For that service, they squeezed somewhere between uh, 900 and 1,000 people into this space. 900 to 1,000, according to uh, Joseph, was as many as could be comfortably situated. Children on the laps of adults, every seat and aisle were crowded, and their dedication service lasted for seven to eight hours. Sidney Rigdon preached that day from this second row from the top, two and a half hours his sermon. Joseph Smith delivered the prayer of dedication. I think he's uh, right here, second row from the top in the center, a prayer of dedication somewhere near a half an hour long. There was a 15 or 20 minute break somewhere in that seven to eight hours, but apparently the only people that left were mothers of infant children who had to go feed them. The rest stayed knowing that if they left, they wouldn't get back in. Hundreds didn't get in. They were standing outside in the snow, trying to listen through the open windows to the service that day. Imagine how disappointing some of those people must have been, disappointed some of them must have been though. Some had spent two or three years of their lives building the temple, but they didn't get there early enough, so they didn't get in. To allow them to fully participate, they decided to repeat the entire service of dedication on the following Thursday. Edward Partridge, church leader there for both, said the second dedication was even better and even longer than the first one. There were months surrounding the temple dedication where the people were recording in their journals incredible spiritual experiences. They talk about things like pillars of fire or tongues of fire on the roof of the temple. They talk of speaking and singing in tongues and interpretations of tongues. They talk about the temple being filled with the sound of a mighty rushing wind. These accounts go on and on and on. And as you probably have recognized, they are using language from the New Testament book, the Acts of the Apostles, to try and capture these experiences. They didn't say, we are living again these New Testament times, but they didn't have to because people recognize they were biblically literate enough to recognize that language and know <laughs> that they were living again. Not just, as David Howlett has pointed out, these people were not just symbolically remembering New Testament, the New Testament church. They were living it again or doing their best to anyway. One of the best known of those, what they called uh, a Pentecostal season, one of the best known of those experiences April 3rd of 1836, one week following the temple dedication. There's once again a Sunday afternoon service going on. Once again, about a thousand people present. The curtains are dropped. The room is four. They're blessing babies and confirming new members in these four areas. While that's happening, it seems, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery retire into the pulpit to pray they don't tell us exactly where. I think it's probably safe to assume somewhere here. They drop the curtains or veils around them. They kneel in prayer. As they finish, they record a vision of the Lord on the breastwork of the pulpit before them, coming to accept of the dedication of the house. And of course, April 3rd of 1836 is Easter. So Joseph and Oliver are having a vision of the risen Lord on Easter Sunday. Uh, the scribe also records accounts of um, Moses, Elias, and Elijah appearing in vision to Joseph and Oliver on that day. We have covered lots and lots of information in a hurry. So questions about things we have talked about or things we haven't? We have lots of questions. And the first one comes from Jean Schertz. And Jean asks, is there an all-seeing eye in the Kirtland Temple? There is not an all-seeing eye on the Kirtland Temple. Um, 
And uh, there's also now and nowhere that says holiness to the Lord. Although I wonder if there might have been something here in the 1830s. Uh, and later, we actually probably also in the 1830s, they're painting slogans on the walls. We're, we're not positive they're there in the 1830s, but they're definitely there not too long after. Um, slogans, some of which um, would be kind of interesting today, things like no cross, no crown, um, and some things in Latin and uh, stuff like that painted on the walls. Uh, outside on the front, the entablature, uh, the sign on the front originally said, House of the Lord, built by the Church of the Latter-day Saints, A.D. 1834. As most of you probably know, remember that the name of the church is the Church of the Latter-day Saints at this point in time. So Joseph establishes the Church of Christ, 1830. 1834, they become the Church of the Latter-day Saints. 1838, the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. Martin Harris stays in Kirtland for decades, continues to worship in the temple. He apparently thought that the name of the church should never have been changed from the Church of Christ to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. So he sends somebody up in 1860 to paint out built by the Church of the Latter-day Saints and paint in built by the Church of Christ. So the, the first name of the church is on the temple second, and the second name of the church is on the temple first. Very confusing. Locke, you talked about uh, the woodwork and a lot of the decorative work throughout the, the lower court. And Myra Elliott asks, all the molding is wood and not plaster? Is there all any the, plaster within that? All the molding is wood and not plaster. So the, the plaster, the lath and plaster ceilings and plaster walls would have been there, but no plaster moldings in the building that, that I've seen any evidence for. Now that the rings where they would have- Yeah, let me back up. Years, you're right, these are plaster. And we actually have, and it might be an 1830s tool or it might be later, but we, we have a plaster sweep. So it's got a little um, uh, kind of point in the middle and you could sweep it around in the, in the wet plaster to form these rings. So that survives in our collections in Kirtland. I'm guessing we found it in one of the crawl spaces. We did find a lot of great treasures in the crawl spaces and underneath the seats in the pulpits. Yeah. Uh, Lori Long asks, how long did it take to build the Kirtland Temple and how many people were involved? The temple is built between 1833 and 1836. And I don't think we have a solid number for the, the, the total of, of folks involved. There is a day in Kirtland where people get blessed who had worked on the temple but it's clearly not a complete list. I think that's in the Kirtland Council Minute book. Um, clearly not a complete list because there are folks like women, uh, at least one who was driving a wagon hauling stone from the quarry to the temple and other women who would have been making the veils and likely uh, maybe the, the carpets um, that didn't get a blessing. Uh, so more involved than show up on that list so I, I don't think we have a, a, a real number. Michael Wellington asks, how would they heat the temple? They heated the temple with apparently four wood burning stoves in the cellar and in the winter months and only in the winter months, you'd see stove pipes coming out of the floors, one here, one over here. Um, let me move back so you can get a better view of it. Uh, so one here and then one on the other side. So four pipes running up. And, and by doing that, you're getting um, heat radiating from the pipes all the way up. And then I think they come together and out. I don't know if it's one or two central chimneys. Um, we, we know that those pipes were there uh, because in, I think it's 1837 when there's dissent in the church. Uh, I think it's Joseph Smith Sr. is preaching and the dissenters storm the temple. Uh, and as they rush in, they knock over a stove pipe. <laughs> you can just imagine soot flying everywhere. Um, they eject the belligerents and continue the services of the day. <laughs> Talk about a fire hazard. Our next question comes from Millie Gentz. And Millie asks, is there no padding on the benches on the second level? This is a question after my own heart. Let's talk about those benches, Locke. 
Yeah. There is no padding on the benches on the second level. Now, um, I, I don't know that those benches are original. I, I was stunned at, at what appears to be the age of these benches on the lower court. They may or may not be original, but they are built of square nails. And when you look carefully at the wood, you see reciprocal cut saw marks, meaning the blade moving straight up and down versus circular cut. Um, those are both things that you want to see in 1830s work. So they might, I, I think it would be stunning if they had survived, but they are very old. Um, and there is a reference, um, I can't remember the date on it, but uh, a reference to people who believed that some of the original padding on the benches had survived. They said it was a little red flower pattern and that they tried to preserve it by not letting anybody sit on the padding. And then finally they broke down and let women and children sit on it and they wore it to shreds and it's gone. Um, so they might have had padding on the benches downstairs originally. While we're here, take a look at the width of the planks of lumber that the pew boxes are made out of. And upstairs, there's some that are even wider in the pulpits. So that's another thing that you want to see when you're trying to figure out what's original and what's not. So these are wonderfully wide planks telling you that they're probably old growth trees. Uh, the second floor, the pew boxes there are built, most of them, of planks six inches wide, very narrow, very uniform. These, not uniform, are quite wide. And when the sun hits these right, you can see it kind of a rippling on the surface from the hand planing. Each stroke of the plane would leave just a slight ripple. So, so it, it seems very likely that these are the original pew boxes on the first floor. It's incredible how much the temple has stayed intact over the, the decades. It really is. Sherry Rushton um, is asking about the choir lofts, and she says, what were the cupboards under the choir used for? What were the cupboards under the choir lofts used for? It's a trick. So uh, I wonder if I can get in one of them. Yep, there we go. So you actually, it's a door that opens up and tiny little steps that you climb up to get into each of the elevated choir boxes. So each one higher than the one before. So they look like cupboards, but they're really elevated pew boxes. And the same is true over here on the sides. You climb up tiny little steps and can go in and, and these are extraordinarily uncomfortable. <laughs> That's um, uh, a right angle between the, the bench and the, the back of the box. <laughs> Very uncomfortable. During the dedication of the temple, remember I mentioned that there are no seats for the apostles at this point in time because they're not supposed to be there, but they were there, of course, during the temple dedication, and they were treated as visiting dignitaries. So on one side, on the west or Melchizedek uh, pulpits, was the High Council of Kirtland, and on the other side, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. In back, on one side, the High Council of Zion or Missouri and on the other side, the presidents of 70. There were also um, choristers sitting in some of these boxes as well as scribes who were taking minutes, taking notes of what was happening. And that's why that very first box, just the first one, these do have a desktop, which flips up, locks into place so that the scribe would have a place to write. It's hard to imagine sitting in those pew boxes or the choir loft for seven to eight hours at a time. Well, I, I've been in them for three hours at a time and it was excruciatingly painful. <laughs> we have run out of questions, but uh, Nanette Disney did mention in the chats that her father, Richard Fenn, preached his very first sermon in the Kirtland Temple. Pam Robeson also mentions that the pew boxes were great for kids to be able to sit on the floor and color during reunion services. Yep. There is another question. This is from Myra Elliott. She says, are there any other church buildings of this style? Other church buildings of this style. So this is vernacular. It's, um, it was not uncommon apparently. And anything I know about architecture, I know 
from Elwin Robinson and, and anything I get wrong is my fault, not his, um, but vernacular. So it is, a, it is a mashup of the styles that they remembered from the places they grew up in and that they liked. So it is not one architectural style, but numerous styles mixed together. Um, Greek Revival, uh, Georgian coins, those, those, and these are kind of elongated, which is unusual, but those stones on the corners of the temple outside, those are Georgian in style, they're coins, Q-U-O-I-N-S. I think there's some Federalist features. Um, so all kinds of styles mixed together. In this part of Ohio at this time, there was kind of a Gothic revival um, taking place. So the, the, the pointed windows, uh, Gothic, uh, but you'll see some of those in churches in this part of Ohio at this time. This was a new Connecticut or the Connecticut Western Reserve. I think one of the Kings of England had granted Connecticut a claim to all of the land from their Western border to where the water ran, which was some interpreted as the Pacific Ocean. So imagine Connecticut uh, having this claim to this long thin strip. After the Revolutionary War, they're convinced to give up that claim. If in return, they're given what would become the Northeast corner of Ohio. It couldn't be Connecticut, they had to sell it. So they, they did, they created the Connecticut Land Company and sent folks out to survey and begin selling. Um, what that meant though, is that this is a really strong New England cultural area. So this part of Ohio, if you drive around out in the country, you run into all these little towns and it feels like they have picked up New England villages and dropped them on the, the shores of Lake Erie. A question from Harston Jared, and he asks, what can you tell us of the foundation and level below grade? So just below this floor is a cellar or crawl space, um, just deep enough that I can walk through most of it. It's got a dirt floor. And we later dug out a little deeper parts of it to put our heating and air conditioning and humidity controls in down below. Um, the walls, again, they started about two feet and there are no footings. So normally you would today build a wide base to, to spread the weight of the wall out. And these are very heavy walls because they're stone. So you want a wide base to spread the weight out that wasn't understood at this point in time. So there is no footing. The wall just starts at two feet and away it goes. And it barely makes it under theoretical frost line. And this part of Ohio has earthquakes. So we have given uh, those walls some help by doing something called compaction grouting. So drilling underneath them and injecting grout or mortar. Uh, which forms these solid balls that provide some additional strength to the soil. Under each of the columns is a sandstone pier as well. So we also strengthened the area under the columns. Something that Elwin points out in his book, which is really well done, it's called uh, The First Mormon Temple, Design, Construction, Historical Context, I think it is. Uh, BYU, I think, published that. Elwin realized that um, Either they weren't quite clear what they were doing early on, or they didn't fully understand um, how to build a big building. But right under this location, there's a sandstone pier. Um, and then there's another one here under this spot and another one here actually makes more sense if we go to the other side. Let's look from the foyer if we can get there. Okay, so under this spot, a sandstone pier, but nothing rests on it, nothing touches it. There's another sandstone pier here, and then this is a timber that goes all the way up to support the west side of the bell tower. And here's another timber hiding in this, right here, it sits on a stand, sandstone pier, that also runs all the way up to support the west side of the bell tower. The east side of the bell tower sits on this sandstone wall, but they're trying to figure out how to support the west side. And it's a huge bell tower and very heavy. But as you've probably figured out, 
this pier has nothing resting on it. They built it and abandoned it because at some point, either they realized you can't transfer weight through windows and a door, <laughs> or they decided to put a window and a door on top of that spot. We're not sure which happened, but they're kind of figuring it out as they go. Because that bell tower is so heavy, through the years, these timbers shrink and compress. So uh, one account talks about, well, even today, you can see that the bell tower leans slightly to the west. And one account, which I have a hard time believing, but it says by the 1880s, there was an 11 inch sag in the floor because of the weight of the bell tower. They unhooked everything and slowly jacked it back up. So there's not an 11 inch sag today. Noel Gafka asks or says, I'm so intrigued. What kind of fun treasures were found under the pews and in the crawl spaces? Go for it, Barb. This is your area of expertise. <laughs> Some of the, the things that I can remember, uh, there were Sunday school class books. Um, David Howlett did a, an article on uh, some of the lessons that were being taught in Sunday school, and those were found uh, underneath the, the benches of the pulpits on the second floor. Uh, there was also an old um, offering, what were those called? It, it was a box that was on the end of a stick that um, the deacons would take down the rows to pick up offerings during the services. Uh, there's a formal name for these boxy offering plates. Um, but one of those was, was found. There was minutes from a Kirtland congregation business meeting, or maybe it was a Kirtland High Council meeting, um, their minutes from the 1920s. And it came across as kind of a journal that included minutes from a number of meetings. And when you go through the, the, media, the minutes, uh, one of the things that really stood out to me was that during that business meeting, there was a heated discussion in the 1920s on whether it was appropriate for church members to play baseball on Sundays. And I'm assuming this is Sunday afternoons. Um, but those are some of the treasures that I can remember. Locke, do you remember any others? Uh, I do not remember others, but I think we're still having that argument, aren't we? Except it's Sunday mornings now. Oh, baseball on Sunday mornings. I think the, that those minutes were found in the crawl spaces. Uh, didn't George Lund find them in the crawl spaces? I think he did. There was also still one of the giant wooden rollers from the second floor, if we can get to it. One of these big rollers is still in one of the crawl spaces that never got installed. It actually was supposed to go above in the crawl space right here. So there's a kind of a slit in the ceiling here, as well as here, and here, and here. So in these areas, the canvas was actually going to be drawn up through the ceiling. And then this little roller and this one would serve like a door. You would just raise the canvas above the aisle. We have two similar questions. Uh, Joanne Guthrie asks, is there a bell in the bell tower? And when is the bell rung? And Elizabeth Ellis asks, is the bell rung for any services? What can you tell us about that bell, Locke? There is a bell in the bell tower. They're trying to get it in the 1830s. W.W. W. Phelps writes to his wife, Sally, and says, a great effort is about to be undertaken to procure a bell for the Lord's house. I don't think it's accomplished, though, or at least I don't have any references to it, until 1890. It's from the Buckeye Bell Foundry in Cincinnati, Ohio and it weighs somewhere over a thousand pounds. We ring the bell on Sunday mornings at nine o'clock to call the locals to worship uh, for decades, those services in the temple. And then in the late 1950s or mid, mid 50s, moved across the street uh, to a new chapel there. They were kind of monopolizing the temple. And so folks coming to, 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 to as tourists were having a hard time seeing it unless they wanted to sit through a long service. Um, so they moved across the street um, but yes, still a bell. We also would ring it um, anytime there's some kind of a national bell ringing activity. We typically would ring it um, occasionally on things like New Year's Eve, depending on if anybody is still up. Uh, so it is still wrong. Uh, 
Lavon LeMay uh, says, wonderful tour, thank you. A silly plaster stucco question. My sister was a guide there in 1981 and said, when there was plaster work done and there were pieces of china in the fallen plaster mixed with lots of human hair. What was the story with all that hair? And Locke, before you answer that question, Lavon, I would love to hear uh, your sister's name, who was a guide there in 1981. If you could uh, send us her name, uh, either in the chat or in the q and I'd love to, to see who that was. So Locke, what can you tell us about human hair in the plaster? The human hair in the plaster, so lots of glass and crockery in the stucco and lots of hair in the plaster. Uh, we turned it into human hair at some point, but but I don't really think it was human hair. It was really common to put uh, animal hair in plaster as a binding agent. It, it holds it together. So that was just, just part of what you normally did. But I think we were trying to make, with, without understanding how plaster worked, I think we were trying to make sense at some point of, well, why is there hair in here? And we ended up developing, and I, I don't know if your sister had heard these or not, but wonderful traditions about how the women sacrificed their hair. They cut their hair and, and donated it for the plaster. Um, I, I have no reason to think that's accurate, but we did end up sharing that understanding eventually. Of course, we also have the wonderful accounts of the women crushing their fine china and glassware. Um, unfortunately, uh, nobody wrote it down at the time. What they did write down is that they're sending out young people to gather old crockery and glass they crushed it even finer and they dumped it into the stucco. So I, I do not know that, that the powerful tradition of crushing fine china and glassware is, is actually true. Um, if, if it's not true, it should have been because that is the kind of sacrifice that people were making, the women were making. Truman Co., a non-member in Kirtland said that the women of the church were asked to give up even the necessaries of life in order to build the temple. And when you see that phrase in the 1830s, that means adequate food, clothing, and shelter. So I think a, a more significant uh, level of sacrifice than, than China. Um, and if it was not true in the 1830s, it became true in the 1950s. Uh, I have met a young woman who, because of those wonderful stories of sacrifice, uh, pulled out from under her bed, she lived in Kirtland, her toy China tea set asked that it be crushed and dumped into the stucco when the temple was restuccoed in the 1950s. And she could actually show me where some of the pieces were. It, once it gets painted over, it's really hard to see. Um, but, but if it was not true in the 30s, it became true in the 1950s. That's a great story. Uh, Lavon responded that Leslie Hagenson is her sister and Leslie still has a piece of the plaster from her time in Kirtland in the 1980s. Nice. Our last question comes from Jean Schertz. And Jean says, you might mention your book, House of the Lord, the story of the Kirtland Temple. It shows much of what you discussed. Yeah, Locke, why aren't you talking about your book? <laughs> I forgot there was one. <laughs> Tell us all about it, Barb. Well, it's true, there is a, a book. It's about 45 pages long. And as Jean mentioned, it's called House of the Lord, the Story of the Kirtland Temple. And it's published by uh, John Whitmer Books uh, and it's available online and at the, the museum stores in Nauvoo and Kirtland. And speaking of, of books, we might take a moment to, to look at some of the books that are available for anyone who is interested in learning more about Kirtland Temple history and architecture or Kirtland history, um, there are a few books to consider. If you're interested in Kirtland Temple history, there's two great books out there. Uh, the first is The Kirtland Temple, The Biography of a Shared Mormon Sacred Space by David Howlett. You can see that book is on the right. And Roger Lanius also wrote a book called The Kirtland Temple, A Historical Narrative. Um, that book came out right before the 150th anniversary of the Kirtland Temple. So it's got a little bit of age to it, um, but still a, a pretty good book. You know, if Kirtland Temple architecture is your thing, you're going to want to check out Elwyn Robison's book, The First Mormon Temple. Design, Construction, and Historic Context of the Kirtland Temple. Lachlan has mentioned this book a couple of times. It's an excellent book. 
in addition, a, a smaller book, but equally as good, is one that Ron Romick published called Behind the Scenes Tour of the Kirtland Temple from Basement to Bell Tower. This is based on the literal behind the scenes tour of the Kirtland Temple. And I encourage you all, if you're ever in Kirtland, to take advantage of that behind the scenes tour. It, it does go from basement to bell tower. And it's perfect if you're interested in architecture. Lastly, if you are interested in learning more about the Kirtland period and all its glorious historical context, I can't recommend enough Mark Staker's book, Harkin OU People, the historical setting of Joseph Smith's Ohio Revelations. This book is around 600 pages long, but well worth the read for church history enthusiasts. Uh, you'll enjoy every page like a nice rich dark chocolate, just it's rich and full of flavor. Um, you'll really enjoy the book. Now, each night of the summer series, We'll end with a favorite story about the historic site featured that night. And since tonight was all about the Kirtland Temple, Locke, do you have a favorite Kirtland Temple story you wish to, to end with tonight? A, a nice take home gift for those in attendance? Oh, and you're muted. They'll enjoy the story much better if they can hear you. <laughs> I think I have a, a different favorite story every time I'm asked, but um, for some reason, I've been thinking about the fact that Joseph Smith in 1830s Kirtland counseled the members. He said, if God gives you a manifestation, keep it to yourself. <laughs> You're not supposed to talk about it. Despite that counsel, people were so overwhelmed by the experiences surrounding the temple dedication that they clearly are talking about it because within 10 days of the dedication, a non-member in Kirtland writes to his sister and says, they say the temple is lit without candles. <laughs> I just, I don't know why I love that. I love it. That is a great story. It, it reminded me that Myra Elliott's first question had to do with that Henry Howe engraving. And I want to circle back to that for anyone who is just dying to figure out what it was that Myra was talking about. Here you'll notice the engraving that dates back to 1846. We believe this building here was the Methodist Meeting House. And this building over here, we think, is the Kirtland Safety Society Bank. But I've also heard people speculate it could have been Oliver Cowdery's law office. Where do you stand on that, Locke? Do you think it's well, the bank? I think Henry Howe thought it was the bank. Um, and I think it could be. I think it probably is. Uh, and then the Methodist Meeting House, that's the second Methodist Meeting House. The first one had burned. And with that, uh, we'll bring our evening program to a close. Thank you so much, Locke, for taking us on this virtual tour of the Kirtland Temple. That was awesome. And thank you to our friends in the audience for attending tonight and um, going through the Kirtland Temple with us. We hope you will join us next week when we take a look at and explore the Joseph Smith Historic Site in beautiful Nauvoo, Illinois. So if you haven't already registered, be sure to do so on our website. And I will drop the link um, where you'll want to go in order to, to register. So until next Thursday, take care, everyone. Keep reading your church history and have a good night. <laughs>